Once again, it's a tremendous pleasure for me to be here among you, uh, many of whom, uh, of you whom I know, some for a long, long time. Uh, you, uh, among you, the people of the Shia, and to observe with you, uh, Mustafa uh, Muhammad Day. Uh, I have been asked to speak briefly um, on the theme of peace and justice. I'm sure that you are all far more conversant with the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet than I am, and I'm always hesitant to look at Islam and to talk about Islam uh, to Muslims, lest I give even the slightest implication or impression of telling Muslims about their own faith. Nonetheless, I have been engaged in the Christian-Muslim dialogue for almost 25 years, and have in that time been privileged to learn a great deal about Islam. All of what I have learned, of course, is filtered through my own being as a, uh, as a Christian. Uh, in, um, in the book that I wrote, for Cat White Catholics Need to Know About Islam, the last chapter says that all I can do is show a system. To understand a faith, I can do a very good job of showing and explaining a, a system of religious belief. But to understand a faith, you really have to name, know the people. I mean, I can tell people what the five prayers are and what Muslims do for the five prayers. But how Muslims feel about the five prayers how the five prayers affect their lives as believers. You have to talk to a Muslim to do that. And so with that, I, when I speak tonight, I speak through the prism of my own, uh, my own particular experience and my own particular identity as a, a Christian. In terms of the topic peace and justice, uh, there are several things which can be said. Uh, there are interesting, although I don't want to push it too far, uh, interesting parallels which can be drawn between the period of the Jahaliya and the modern world. Mecca, as far as we know, was a fairly cosmopolitan city, a hub of trade in which many people had become very wealthy. The annual pilgrimage to Mecca brought considerable trade and wealth to the Meccans, and they had a vested interest in maintaining it without change. As in any wealthy society, our own also included, it's clear that materialism and indifference to the plight of the poor and the weak had become part and parcel of Meccan society. In addition, there were customs prevalent in the Arabian Peninsula, such as the burying alive of infant girls, uncontrolled blood feuds, which rendered the society brutal. On the one hand, extremely sophisticated, extremely wealthy. On the other side, brutal. We can draw parallels again, I think. Likewise, at least among the Bedouin, uh, the role of women in society was not much better than that of cattle. In Mecca, it seems, the situation may have been different, as would be indicated, as you know, by Khadija, uh, the wife of the Prophet, who seems to have been fairly well -to -do, a fairly well-to-do woman uh, who ran her own business. Nonetheless, Arabian society and the Jahaliya was stratified violent and indifferent to the poor. Sounds a bit familiar. The message which Muhammad proclaimed wasn't, of course, was a spiritual message, but it was not merely spiritual in the sense that it did not impact the day-to-day -day lives of people. Islam 
Submission to God brought with it practical consequences in a person's private and social life. Islam was a message directed not merely to individuals, but to the entire community. It seems that the Meccans recognized this almost instinctively. Uh, Islam was not merely a change of religious allegiances. Uh, the Meccans were fairly capable of absorbing all sorts of foreign religious practices, as can be noted by the large number of idols which were in the bait, or in the, uh, the air, uh, I don't know another word, the bait, the house, before the coming of Islam. It was not merely a question of adding another idol to the pantheon. Islam was a call to a radical change on about how people dealt with things. Although Mecca was an urban center, tribal and family loyalties were the building blocks of Meccan society. One belonged to a tribe, a clan, a family, and was protected by it. We can see how important this was in the life of the Prophet, when in 619, uh, Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, died, and Muhammad was left without protection against his enemies. Without the protection of a clan, Muhammad could have been killed with impunity, with no one to call his murderer to account. Connected with clan protection, what connected with the notion of clan protection with the notion of blood vengeance. When, and it was often, someone was killed, it was incumbent upon his or her, most likely his, tribe to exact vengeance uh, from the perpetrator or the perpetrator's family. Sometimes this was in the form of a financial arrangement, but often it was in the form of the next of kin of the murdered person killing the murderer. This, in turn, obliged the killed murderer's next of kin to avenge him, and you get a spiral. Thus, in terms, this, in terms, obliged the killed murderer to avenge him, and blood feuds could go on for long periods of time with a good number of people losing their lives. Uh, the coming of Islam changed the very fabric of Arabian society. Instead of the clan being the basic building block of society, Islam was. In a very important sense, it was no longer every clan for itself. In the place of the clan or the tribe, the ummah, or the community, or probably less accurately, nation, appeared. The community was no longer governed by tribal interests, but by religion. To be sure, it took a while, several generations in fact, before Islam began to codify its practices. But in the earliest community, the Prophet was able to make rulings as problems arose and to answer questions and to solve problems. After his death and after the death of the, uh, the companions and the helpers of the Prophet, Prophet, things became increasingly difficult. Muslims had the Quran and the Sunnah to guide them, but increasingly a body of literature arose which helped guide Muslims and helped them to live in accordance with what they believed was God's will. This brought a tremendous change in society. Clearly, the Quran was concerned with a type of justice which was new to the people of Arabia. Surah 4, 136 illustrates this. Remember the old clan society. Now the Quran is saying, O you who believe, be strict in the observance of justice and be witnesses for God, even though it be against yourselves or your parents or your kindred, whether they be rich or poor. This is clearly a justice which <coughs> transcends tribe, clan, or status in society. As part of a community, Muslims were called to observe a transcendent type of justice. A notion of humanity as one, uh, chapter 2, verse 214, and of responsibility for all, 
was introduced. The principle, whoever kills a person, it shall be if he killed all humanity. And whoever gives life to one, it shall be as if he gave life to all humanity, greatly expanded the moral arena of the Jahaliya. In addition, of course, the more brutal practices of the Jahaliya, such as infanticide of girls, was forbidden. Over the centuries, a body of legal opinions, fiqh, uh, developed as different peoples and cultures became Muslim. The experience of each generation, culture, and place became a rich source of reflection as Muslims tried to set up a just society. Uh, it's here that I might add that I find the Shiite notion of ongoing ijtihad uh, to be helpful in that it recognizes that each historical and cultural situation needs to struggle uh, to discover how one is to live rightly and to set up and to maintain a just society. In a sense, this struggle, this ijtihad, is never ending because of the flow of history and the diversity of societies, which Muslims believe to be the will of God. In the Quran it says that God could have made everyone to be one people, but that God did not specifically, but God made different tribes and peoples and nations which means that diversity, cultural diversity, diversity of societies, is part of the will of God. Several times in the Quran, Muslims are challenged to vie with each other and with others in virtue. Uh, in terms of peace and justice, uh, in terms of the Shiite tradition, one of the instructions of Ali to his governor, Malik al uh, I find very interesting, and is, it's almost like looking through a keyhole at a much larger world. Uh, he writes to the governor, and he says, quote, infuse your heart with mercy, love, and kindness for your subjects. Be not in, in the face of them a voracious animal, counting them as easy prey, for they are of two kinds. Either they are your brothers in religion or your equals in creation. Error catches them unaware, deficiencies overcome them, evil deeds are committed by them intentionally and by mistake. So grant them your pardon and your forgiveness to the same extent that you hope God will grant you his pardon and his forgiveness. For you are above them, and he who appointed you is above you. And God is above him who appointed you. God has sought from you the fulfillment of the requirements, and he is trying you with them. And so, the ideal of a just leader. As far as peace is concerned, one needs uh, only to look at the behavior of Muhammad, uh, especially in the early Meccan period. Uh, I don't, the expression, when the Prophet lived in the house of Aqam, in that particular period, when the persecution uh, was especially, uh, especially brutal and especially severe. Uh, we tend to read uh, Ibn Ishaq's Sira, uh, and we hear stories about so-and-so and so-and-so uh, accepting Islam and becoming a Muslim. Uh, what we tend to forget many times is that this or that person is becoming a Muslim is often someone who, was a, who had been a bitter enemy of Muhammad and of the early Muslim community. Uh, and so what's interesting in terms of peace, when former enemies wished to embrace Islam, they were never punished and never turned away. Even when in 630 Muslims were, enter, were able to enter victoriously into Mecca, there was no general massacre. Those who were willing to accept Islam were accepted without distinction, even though this was later to cause problems in the so-called uh, first uh, Riddha war, or the first Fitna. In the Shiite tradition, the desire to solve conflicts possibly can be seen, first of all, in an, uh, an interesting example 
in the behavior of Imam Ali at the Battle of Safin in 657. Although he clearly realized it was not to his advantage, Imam Ali agreed to arbitration uh, to settle the dispute between him and Muawiyah. Uh, ultimately, it was a decision which led to his death because with that decision arose the uh, Haraji uh, sect and ultimately one of the Haraji or Hawarij were, uh, was the one who assassinated Ali. Of course, the example of Hussein ibn Ali is another prominent example of a person willing to die for justice and for peace. The search for justice and peace is, as the practice of which Jihad recognizes, an ongoing and indeed in this world never ending process. It is a struggle in which both Christians and Muslims in our own way engage as we try to encounter a world which is different from the past and which has new challenges. We struggle to be faithful to that past as we encounter new realities. How does one live a good, that is, faithful and virtuous life in the modern world? How can we take our own particular notion of justice from our traditions and apply them faithfully in a religiously pluralistic world? These are questions which are not easily answered. However, both of our traditions, Christian and Muslim, have always had to face changing circumstances. The questions and some of the problems may be new, but the struggle to be faithful, to be people of integrity and faith, has not changed. Perhaps one of the more interesting challenges of our present era, especially in the United States and Canada, is the challenge that both our communities face, uh, the challenge to both of our communities, to face the new world together as members of different religious traditions, but as brothers and sisters, all people of the book. Uh, thank you very much.